All right, we got a great hour ahead for you guys on the Young Turks. I'm your host, Jay Guger. Uh, Jesus is directing, JR's uh, producing. You see how I flipped that? Can't keep up with this show, man. It's you're going over here, we're going over there because we're keeping it uh, fun and exciting for everybody. Uh, later in this hour, you're going to find out Sean Hannity's definition for peace, which is, say it with me, awesome. Okay. Furthermore, Lieutenant Uhura is on the program. Yesterday we were talking about would we rather have a transporter, a holodeck, uh, or a replicator. Okay? We had a long conversation about that here in the studio. And boom, all of a sudden, Lieutenant Uhura shows up. She's got all three. We're going to interview her later in this hour. Uh, if you don't know some of the sh shocking things about her, stick around. All right, now, we start with health care reform because we got uh, interesting news going forward. Finally, of course, as you guys know from yesterday, uh, the bill has come out of the Senate Finance Committee, which means that it's going to the overall Senate. And Olympia Snow voted in favor of it, the first Republican. Unbelievable. She said that she uh, didn't want to get in the way of history, right? And now uh, we have a second Republican who might be interested in voting for it, also from the state of Maine, Susan Collins, saying, hey, I'm listening. Now, this is good news and bad news. You know, they get those two, they call it bipartisan, everybody's happy, except in order to get those two, they might give tremendous uh, concessions that I uh, hope that they don't give. Uh, most importantly, of course, as we've discussed uh, many times, is the public option. Uh, right after voting in favor of the funny Finance Committee version of health care reform, Snow came out today and said, don't get me wrong, I got no interest in a public option. So if you're heading in that direction, uh, I'm not with you. Now, she said, look, I am interested in a trigger. So if the healthcare industry continues to uh, ream us for uh, a couple of more years or decades, well, then maybe it could get triggered. Or as Malcolm Fleshner said on the program, maybe we could get a trigger of a trigger. And then four years later, if things aren't going well, then that'll cause a trigger to wait another four years. Or what we could do is fix the system now, because it's already broken, right? I know, call me crazy. So, but she's still on that war path for the trigger, so it's good news, bad news that uh, the ladies from Maine are thinking of voting for health care reform. Now, the guy who's going to have to decide whether the public option goes in the package or not is really one guy. At this point, by far the most important guy is Harry Reid. As I say it, I begin to work. <laughs> Literally. Like, I hadn't planned on getting worried, but as I was saying the words, I was like, oh boy, we're in trouble. <laughs> now, there's pressure on him from both sides, which doesn't usually happen. Usually there's pressure from the right and not very much pressure from the left. So that's the good news. Now, is there pressure from the right? You betcha. And uh, he says, look, you know what? I'm considering everything, and uh, my job here is basically herding cattle. Uh, one of his aides said that, and that uh, he keeps the, quote, training, it trains moving on time. I wouldn't have gone with that analogy. So, okay, don't, don't, don't let the Republicans hear you say that. Uh, and then uh, he says, basically, my job is to get 60 votes. Now, when he starts talking in that language, that means I'm going to go reach out to the conservatives and the corporatists to try to beg them for the votes and not be strong. That seems to be the indication. Now, the jury's way out. He has not done either one of those things yet. And for the first time ever, pressure from the left in the Senate by the Democrats. I know, it just it seems shocking. But uh, here it comes. And of all people, Senator Chuck Schumer remembered that he was a liberal. Okay. All right, get a little of this. A very tough and very demanding of Reid. Clip number seven best efforts the public option was not part of it why not well we didn't have the votes obviously but we are making good progress once again we never thought we'd win in the finance committee but 30 democrats signed a letter saying the public option must be in the combined bill there are many others who were supportive uh, the four of us in the leadership didn't sign the letter because it was to the leadership we're for it as well and i am very optimistic that we're going to get a strong public option the house is standing firm on public option and i think all of those when they saw the vote in the finance committee who thought oh it's over hadn't really read the situation correctly well how do you get it done how does it end up in the final bill 
Well, first, Leader Reid has the option of putting it in the final bill. If he puts it in the final bill, in the combined bill, then you would need 60 votes to remove it, and there clearly are not 60 votes against the public option. Um, if, and so we're urging him to do that, and he's seriously considering it. Once it passes the Senate, if that were to happen, uh, it's in the House bill, it's in the Senate bill, and it would have to be in the final product. So um, it's very important to see if the public option is in the bill that Leader Reid puts together. He hasn't yet made up his mind, but many of us who believe in the public option are urging him to do so, and uh, so far uh, we're, getting, we're getting heard. Uh, now, he didn't shout and scream, but uh, at the end of that video, I wanted to say, oh, damn, he just called his ass out. He did. He said, look, the guy who's responsible for this, who's going to make the ultimate decision, is Harry Reid. Now, I just told you that's the case, so why is that so shocking? That another senator would actually say it and put pressure on Reid. And he said, look, if you put the public option in, this is a critical part, then you need 60 votes to get it out. Instead of 60 votes in favor of the public option, Schumer's framing it as 60 votes against the public option to get it out if Reid puts it in. And that is accurate. Now, can the Republicans, you know, and look, it depends on how you frame the filibuster, etc. But one thing is indisputable. They need to get 41 votes to say a filibuster under no conditions will we accept this. And I'm not sure the Republicans can get 41 votes to filibuster it. Not against the bill, but to say, no, we're going to do something extraordinary and stop this bill. Be the cow on the track, as Michael Steele would put it. All right, so it's, it's great to see Schumer fighting on the right side. It's refreshing, and, and I almost can't quite believe my eyes or, he, or, or, or my ears in this case. Now, so let's get to Reed. What's he going to do? Well, I gave you some quotes earlier. Here's Jim Manley, uh, Reed's spokesperson. He said, um, Senator Reed is focused on crafting a health care bill that will overcome a Republican filibuster. You see the tea leaves there? That's not good. That if he had said, Senator Reid is interested in a strong health care reform package that's going to do the best it can for the American people, that might mean, no, he's going to go for a public option. If he says, look, I'm trying to get 60 votes, I'm trying to get 60 votes, that means uh, he's going to buckle to the right-wingers. Okay? Uh, and that's, look, again, it's not decided. I'm just saying which way it leans based on these quotes. It's my job to analyze this for you. All right, so uh, he continues. Stripping Democratic senators. Oh, I should tell you this ahead of time. So Grayson uh, goes in with the PCCC. Okay. Now we've got two strong fighters, right? Remember, Progressive Change Campaign Committee, they're fighting left and right, and they're running ads against the uh, corporatist Democrats, against the Republicans, including Snow and in Maine. Did that have an effect in flipping Snow? Maybe, right? Alan Grayson, as you guys all know, is kicking ass, taking names. And so uh, the PCCC got uh, 87,000 signatures telling Harry Reid very specifically, if any Democrats or anyone in the Democratic caucus joins the Republican filibuster, you should take away their chairmanship. There has to be consequences. If there aren't consequences, then they're not going to vote with you, obviously. If there are only consequences that on the other side, they're going to lose their lobbyist money, and there are no consequences from your side, well, then obviously you're not going to win. So playing hardball, that's exactly right. And Alan Grayson takes the signatures and gives it to Senator Reid's office. Goes here, in case we weren't clear enough, right? So then Manley, the spokesperson for Reid, continues. Stripping Democratic senators of their leadership titles is a decision that would be left up to the caucus, not Senator Reid. In light of this reality, it's unlikely that the caucus would ever go along with this idea. That's bad news. <laughs> Number one, it's not true. Senator Reid, of course, can do it. Uh, he's the Senate majority leader. That's totally within his power. Uh, they're punting over to the caucus, so when they don't do it, they go, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, the caucus didn't want to do it, right? And then number two, they think the caucus would never go along with it. So if you're not going to put any pressure on Lieberman or Ben Nelson, etc., uh, well then, obviously, you're not interested in, you know, in fighting for the public option. So, again, I hesitate in saying obviously, but uh, it's going in that direction. And... Uh, it, Look, you know, the thing is, Reed's in a lot of trouble, right? In, because he's got a race in 2010 in Nevada. His popularity is down to 38%. If you're an incumbent, we've told you this a hundred times. And when it, when it applies to Republicans, it applies to Democrats just as much. If you're under 50%, you're in a world of trouble, okay? If you're at 38%, you're in, 
you're in a universe of trouble. Okay. So now, of course, Reed, being who he is, thinks, I've got to run to the right, I've got to run, 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 run to the right to try to get my popularity back. But you're misreading it, man. We've had people call on the show. We've had many emails. The problem is you don't have Democratic support. Progressives and liberals think, I'm going to fight for Harry Reid. When's the last time he fought for me? So you don't have either side. That's why you're caving in at 38%. Because, look, they elected you in the first place. Nevada voted for Obama. You can and, and the demographics in uh, Nevada are shifting Democratic uh, on a daily basis. You'd be in great shape if you were actually a strong Democrat. Can I ask this crazy question of Harry Reid? Did you ever consider this? Two things. One, that if you were strong, that, you, that might actually help you electorally. That you might energize the people on your side. They might come out and vote for you. They might even campaign for you. Forget everything else you've ever done. If you got a public option as part of a strong health care reform effort here, and you got it passed before the elections, I can guarantee you this. All of a sudden, all the progressives and all the Democrats in Nevada would be excited about you for the first time. Okay, maybe for the second time, maybe they were initially excited, right? And then the second thing is, look, even if you don't make it, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. What are you a senator for? Why are you the Senate Majority Leader? Just to keep getting reelected, reelected until they will you out? No, this is what people are remembered for. Even if you lose, which I don't think you will, I think you'll win if you act strong. But even if you lose, if anything was worth it, wouldn't this be it? Then it'll forever be known that Harry Reid got real health care reform passed. No matter what happened to Harry Reid afterwards, and no matter what he did before or after, you would get tremendous credit for that. Because when the bottom line is what matters here. I, has he ever considered that? I wonder. I wonder if they talk about that in his office. And I, I hope he gets influenced by people like Chuck Schumer and Alan Grayson and others to have a backbone. As I say it, I can't quite believe it. But hey, look, the jury's out. And I, we're all open-minded, and action is what matters. So he still has a chance. Now, they asked staffers about Harry Reid and about his popularity within the caucus uh, of the Democrats. And one high-ranking staffer said, quote, they love him. He has a grip on them that is unbelievable. But this is a big moment for him. He has to hold the left and the center. Then he has to worry about Olympia Snow. There's a lot at play. Now, again, I don't think that quote uh, is going in the right direction, right? But it's funny, because for a long time, the Democratic um, senators have loved Harry Reid. Why? because he was just as weak as they were. He was a good representation of them. They wanted to, you know, bend to Bush and Cheney's will, and Reid did it for him. Now it looks like there are some folks that have a backbone there, and some people that are going to fight back. And if that's the case, they might not love him as much. So then he'd be in trouble back at home and with his own caucus. This is a real turning point for Harry Reid. Which direction is he going to go? If history is a guide, I'm worried, right? But uh, being a foolish lib that I am, I, st I still hold out a little bit of hope. A little bit of hope. Let's see how it goes. Uh, he will probably decide within the next two weeks, and, and that'll be very, very important. Look, I I've got a little bit more on health care reform because the, the Republicans citing that nonsense study by the health care insurance industry takes a comical turn, right? And then we have a terrible gay beating. So there's a lot of news coming up. But let's take a quick break here and come back and do that for you. Young Turks. Get the most from your ex People talk about back on the Young Turks. All right, now let's finish up health care for you guys. A couple of important things. Uh, you know, uh, we gave you the quotes from Harry Reid as to which direction he wants to go. I want to give you one quote from Alan Grayson as he handed off those 87,000 signatures to Harry Reid encouraging him to uh, fight for the public option. Grayson said, quote, every single day in America, 122 more Americans die for lack of health insurance. That means that as we stand here in front of you right now, one or two or three more Americans have died because we have not acted yet. I uh, apologize to the dead and their loved ones for our inaction. Now it's time to move, move beyond that and get the job done. Look, those are strong statements. So if Harry Reid wanted to go in that direction, 
he could make statements like that too. He said, look, I'd love to, you know, compromise with the right wingers in this case, but people are dying and we need to act right now and we need to give them options. Can you imagine Harry Reid saying that? But, 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 good news, good news. All right, so, uh, you know how I told you guys the uh, main lobby for the health insurance companies uh, attacked and they released a study saying, oh, uh, in the next 10 years, your premiums are going to go up $4,000 uh, if this version of uh, health care reform passes because they haven't funneled enough uh, you know, uh, customers our way. It, even the version without the public option, they're uh, against it, right? That really pissed off a lot of the Democrats. Even Max Baucus said it was a hatchet job. The White House said it was blindsided by it. So now, wow, Democrats on the warpath, including Harry Reid. Let me give you this encouraging quote. Oh, wait, let me explain first. Uh, th what they're going on the warpath over is the antitrust exemption. They say, all right, you want to play hardball? Okay, you know what? There are other things other than the public option and other ways to, uh, or, or the mandates, et cetera. You know, you guys have an antitrust exemption, which there's no reason for on the federal level. So that uh, pushes the regulation over to the state side, right? Like, how about we take away your antitrust exemption so you really have to compete? To which I say, of course, of course you should do that. They should have done that a long time ago. In fact, Senator Leahy, to his credit, had introduced a bill earlier to do that, right? So now he's reintroducing it, and he's got some supporters. Uh, Schumer, before I get to the read quote, said the health insurance antitrust exemption is one of the worst accidents of American history. It deserves a lot of the blame for the huge rise in premiums that has made health insurance so unaffordable. It is time to end this special status and bring true competition to the health insurance industry. Booyakasha. That's right. Because look, what we're looking for is competition. Because why? You and I want our prices lower, right? The premiums lower. And look at the healthcare industry. They're so arrogant that they're threatening us that they're going to raise our premiums by $4,000 for the average American family if we don't do what they tell us to do, right? Well, how about we take away your antitrust exemption that prevents the competition and see how you do in real competition? You like apples? How you like them apples? And look at Harry Reid now. There isn't anything we can do to satisfy them in this health care bill. Nothing. Referring to the health care insurance industry. They are so anti-competitive. Why? Because they make more money than any other business in America today. What a sweet deal they have. Now, when you see that, you're like, whoa, that's nice strong language. Is that hope I see? Nah. Mm. <laughs> don't bet on it. Let's put it that way. Don't bet on it. But it's encouraging. Okay? Fair is fair. So now, that study that they put out, the healthcare industry, nonsense, right? Absolute nonsense. In fact, it's such nonsense. This is great. You ready for this? Price Waterhouse Cooper is the company that they hired to do the study. Price Waterhouse Cooper now saying, backpedal, backpedal, backpedal. They're like, well, you know, we kind of distance ourselves from that study. I'm not sure. I'm like, you know, they hired us to do it. Uh, do we stick by it? I don't know. Here's a, a quote that their spokesperson said at Price Waterhouse Cooper. Um, America's health insurance plans engaged PricewaterhouseCoopers to prepare a report that focused on four components of the Senate Finance Committee proposal. As the report itself acknowledges, other provisions that are part of health reform proposals were not included in the PricewaterhouseCoopers analysis. In other words, we purposely left things out to make it seem like the premiums were going to go up because that's what the health care insurance lobby paid us to do. This study is garbage. It's not worth the, print it, the paper that it's printed on, right? So, you want to see a collection of Republicans uh, arguing for it? What do we tell you? As soon as the study came out, I said the Republicans will take this and pretend it's reality. So, in this clip, you're going to hear from Senator Kyle from Arizona, all Republicans, uh, Crapo from Wisconsin. He's going to be arguing with the director of uh, the Congressional Budget Office, which is going to tell him, no, you're wrong. And then Cornyn from Texas, Bunning from Kentucky, and then Gingrey. Uh, as well. All right, so let's watch. CBO and Milliman and Price Waterhouse all agree that insurance premiums for families in America will go up. Uh, you indicated that although you haven't scored it and don't have specific numbers, that the overall impact of this bill on the cost of health care insurance will be to drive the cost of that insurance up. Is that correct? 
So that is not a conclusion of our senator. What we've said in a separate letter to Senator Baucus a few weeks ago is that there are a variety of forces working on affecting private insurance premiums and the amount that people would pay for health insurance. And some of the changes in the proposal would tend to push down those premiums. Some would tend to push up those premiums. And because there are so many conflicting forces, we have not been able to assess the net impact on premiums. So since there was a little bit of news made over the weekend about the Price Waterhouse study, I wanted to confirm the fact that that study was, in fact, backed up, both by Milliman, another health care consultant, and by the CBO. What a All joke. of whom agree that premiums will go up. As CBO a result just of this said it would. But that is not a conclusion of our senator. I would like to uh, go back to some of the discussion about the uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers study that was released and Fours. which has been uh, criticized because it was paid for by the insurance industry. And it would be a, a cruel, uh, a cruel outcome indeed if, in fact, unintentionally, we actually increased uh, their health insurance costs. And a recent study suggests that American families will pay more than four hundred or four thousand dollars in 19 tw or 20,019 because of this bill. It increases the average insurance premium for Amer American families by $4,000 and it still leaves 25 million Americans uninsured. What did I tell you, man? I said in the middle of that clip, I said whores, because that's what they are, they're corporate whores. I mean, they just took that study, which now the guys who conducted the study, Price Waterhouse, I just read you the quote, are saying, yeah, that study was total BS, right? And they're like, oh, what, what, what? It's going to increase your premiums. You see that? The healthcare industry told me to. And then they said, the CBO said it. Except the CBO director, you just saw on the tape, said, uh, no, that's not what we're telling you. That is not our conclusion, right? And then you saw Bunning in there. What a, what a pathetic old fool. You know, in the year 2019, your premiums are going to go up. Well, in 2019, probably they will. Uh, anyway, okay, they just, they're bought and paid, man. I mean, if you're a conservative and you're relying these, on these Republicans to fight for you and not the corporate interests to fight for the average American, <laughs> Boy, man, I feel bad for you, man. They, they don't give a rat's ass about you. <laughs> All they care about is the guys who are paying them. I mean, that was a perfect example of how bought and sold they are. All right, now, a uh, quick note on a very quizzical retirement, uh, Congressman Wexler from Florida, who's a young congressman and was seen as, you know, a fairly, you know, accomplished, rising star, etc. He's known for going on the Colbert Report and did the funny thing about the uh, prostitutes and the, and the cocaine, if you remember that. Uh, but he was doing a good job. He was on, uh, you know, fighting for some of the t uh, causes that people believed in, fairly strong advocate for his side, etc., uh, resigning out of nowhere. Now, first thing I thought, of course, was first thing anybody thinks when someone young resigns for no reason in politics, who do you have sex with, <laughs> right? And we don't know yet. Of course, there's, as Bush would say, speculation. Uh, but, uh, but he says, no, he's leaving for the Center for Middle East Peace and Economic Cooperation, that he's got bills to pay, and that he's going to be able to help in the Middle East process um, and maybe pressure Israel to listen to Obama more by going uh, in that direction. It could be. It could be. Maybe they have a plan for him that uses him in that direction. Uh, the fact that he has a job coming out is uh, uh, at least a sign that says that maybe it's legitimate, you know, because if he said, I'm going to spend time with his, fa uh, with his family, oh, it's over. Then it was definitely an affair, right? But as it stands, uh, maybe they're up to something else. But one thing's for certain. They're up to something, right? Something happened. Uh, and we, we just don't know what it is yet. Uh, an up-and-coming congressman who's fairly young doesn't retire out of nowhere. And earlier he had given quotes about how much he loves being a congressman, loves his job, and would like to stay there a while. Mm. So it could be something good where he's going to, you know, help out on the Middle East peace deal, uh, you know, from the private sector or from, uh, you know, from an organization that has in the past been a little waning apparently, uh, but now regaining strength to, to push for peace. Could be or it could be negative. So stay tuned and we'll find out. At least he didn't do that great excuse that the UN ambassador uh, John Danforth did for Bush. Oh, my uh, wife twisted her ankle. I gotta go. <laughs> that was like the best of all time. All right, now, um, 
Another issue that's being uh, discussed and debated right now in the uh, c Congress is um, hate crimes legislation, and it's being put in a in a defense bill. And Republicans have some legitimate uh, beef with this. Now they think that it's punishing speech as much as it is punishing violent acts. They say if there's a violent act, that should be punished to the full extent of the law, no matter what was said during the act. I think that they have a legitimate case to, to make there. You might not agree, and I think it's a close call. And you can say, hey, look, it's an aggra aggravating factor. We take a lot of aggravating factors into account when sentencing uh, someone who's been convicted. So there's good cases to be made on both sides. And then they say it shouldn't be attached to the defense bill, which I think is actually a fair point as well, right? I think that issue is is one where we could have legitimate disagreement without anybody being a bad guy. Okay, in my opinion, you could disagree, obviously. Um, but as usual, they take a twist on it that doesn't make any sense. So John Boehner says, "Well, look, I'm in favor." He's of course the leader for the Republicans in the Congress in the House. Uh, he says, "I'm in favor of the existing federal protections. That's based on race, religion, and gender. I just don't want to uh, bring in the new factors, which is gender identity." And uh, and some of the others, but basically, he and disability, et cetera. But he's mainly worried about gender identity, so it, he doesn't want to include gays and lesbians, et cetera. So they say, well, why the distinction? It, because others, other Republicans like uh, Congressman Price, are at least consistent on it. And his office said, look, um, we don't believe that we believe that this is a constitutional issue. We believe that uh, we're basically uh, punishing speech here, and as heinous as that speech might be, we shouldn't be doing that. So we don't think it should apply to race, uh, religion, gender, or gender identity. That's a more consistent position and a more defensible position. Uh, Boehner says, no, his office says, no, no, no. Uh, the reason I want the other ones is because they're immutable characteristics. There's nothing you could do about them. You're born that way. But being gay is a decision. So if someone beats your ass over it, well, what? Is the conclusion you had it coming because you made that choice? See, now that starts to get a little ugly, right? Second of all, that makes no sense. Yes, you're born into a certain religion. Some of us are. Some are, aren't even born into any religion. But you can definitely change your mind. Religion is not an immutable characteristic. I changed my religion. I, I decided to become agnostic because I didn't believe anymore. It is, I mean, I, it couldn't be less immutable. It is definitely an opinion or a, conclusion that you reach. It's a conviction that you have, but it isn't an immutable characteristic. And on the other hand, most people would argue, and I think a lot of scientists would argue, almost all of them, that being, you know, your gender identity, gay, lesbian, transgender, whatever it might be, is born, you are born that way. It is an immutable characteristic. So of course John Boehner flips logic on its head. Now, as they're having this debate on whether uh, we should have you know, a legislation to uh, make uh, hate crimes um, protected uh, or protect gays in uh, prosecution of hate crimes, I should say. Uh, we had a hate crime against gays uh, that happened in New York. And it's particularly vicious. We have a news report on it we want to show you, uh, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Here it is. Uh, clip number 13 senseless. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see the two attackers shove and punch Jack Price, the openly gay victim, now in a medically induced coma. The attack accelerates, with both suspects flailing their arms at the helpless 49-year-old. For a moment, the victim manages to get up and stumbles to the pavement, but the pummeling continues in the middle of 123rd Street. It's terrible. It's a despicable crime. The individual was attacked uh, uh, simply uh, for his, his orientation, and uh, we're just not going to tolerate it in this city. At a question and answer session, Police Commissioner Ray Kelly held up a photo of one of the gay bashing suspects. 21-year-old Daniel Rodriguez is still at large. Investigators have already arrested and charged a second man, 26-year-old Daniel Alleman, with assault as a hate crime. Alleman's lawyer has insisted his client was fighting in self-defense. Yeah, but yeah. The video, the kid pulled him back two times as he tried to get away. There's a video that a store owner has that he gave to the detectives, and he two times got away, and two times they pulled him back and started brutally beating him up again. There is no sound on the surveillance video, but prosecutors say the two attackers repeatedly yelled anti-gay slurs as they cracked their victim's ribs and shattered his jaw. After a full minute of pounding on price, the two attackers walk away, only to pick something up off the street, possibly the victim's wallet. 
They give it back to him, but they also give the battered man one last brutal slap to the face. Yeah, I mean, that is so vicious uh, that I can't, my mind can't comprehend it. I mean, you do that to somebody who's defenseless? It, it seems inhuman to me. I, I just can't quite imagine what it would take to do that. By the way, Daniel Rodriguez has been taken into custody now since that report. Uh, he was captured in Norfolk, Virginia, so they're both under arrest, and we got both the guys. Now, look, if some will say, look at this. This is, you know, as bad a hate crime as you can have, and it's obviously an aggravating factor. They beat this guy senseless just because he was gay, and others will say, look, they beat the guy senseless. They should be punished to the full extent of the law, whether... Uh, you know, they attacked him whether he was gay or straight or for whatever reason. Uh, I think both are fair arguments. I, I know one thing. Man, they better throw whatever they got at these guys and make sure that they go away for a long, long time. And as I see them attacking this poor guy, I think, what would cause someone to do this, right? And honestly, my theory is that they've got to have some sort of feelings inside themselves. They're not hitting him, they're hitting themselves. Like, now maybe I'm that psycho babble, and, and it's entirely possible that I don't know what I'm talking about, okay? But I think, why would you do that to somebody else? Unless there's something that you're fighting internal, and you're venting that in some weird way on somebody when you see that he's gay. So, look, I, I don't want to get into accusations of what they are, what they think they are. I mean, what we know is that they're vicious, and they're criminals and they should be convicted. But uh, I think that if you do that to somebody when it's not about them, obviously, it's about you. And so I got to wonder what's going through Daniel Alleman and Daniel Rodriguez's head there. Uh, but we can all agree, put them away. Put them away for a long, long time. Young Turks. All right, welcome back to the Young Church. We've got a couple of great things for you in this segment. Uh, we're going to talk to Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura, in just a second. But I did promise you that Hannity clip earlier that i got to give to you. You know, uh, the guys on Fox News were concerned that uh, Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize, even though they don't know why the White House would think that they're Republican shills or uh, purely conservatives. They have no idea why. Uh, but uh, Hannity came up with a very interesting definition of peace, and... This might explain why Republicans don't often win peace prizes. Let's check it out. Here you are, you're a liberal. You probably define peace as the absence of conflict. I, I define peace as the ability to defend yourself and blow your enemies into smithereens. You that know, wasn't that a true sister. That's the Hannity, that's the Hannity <laughs> definition of peace. No, listen, if there are evil people that want to destroy innocent souls, I want to blow them to smithereens before they hurt innocent people. Gee, I wonder why Republicans and conservatives don't win more Nobel Peace Prizes. I can't quite figure it out. And then they bellyache about it. If that's your definition of peace, of course you're not going to win a Nobel Peace Prize. They, they, they're, they're ongoing jokes, man. It's just every day they deliver us new material. They're unbelievable. All right, now, uh, the interview that I've been looking forward to all day long. Uh, Nichelle Nichols is uh, the person who played Lieutenant Uhura, of course, very famously on Star Trek. She's also in a new movie called A Torturer, and uh, she joins us now. She's been in about 100 different things, which we're going to discuss in a second. But, Nichelle, how are you? I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? I mean, uh, I'm delighted to be with you uh, tonight. No, it, it's, it's great to have you. I, I want to talk so much about your career. First, I did not know that you sang with Duke Ellington and Lionel Hampton. H how did that happen? Well, I grew up in musical theater. That means that I was a singer, a dancer, an actor, uh, built sets, wrote scripts, <laughs> wrote songs, everything from a very young age. And that's all I wanted to do in my life, with the ultimate being Broadway. And a funny thing happened on my way to that kind of, of success. Uh, somebody named Gene Roddenberry wrote a... A series that took us into the uh, tw uh, 23rd century and changed the way people 
fought in this world here at this point in time forever. Uh, many, know, many people. Have, I have, I have thousands of of emails and and uh, fan mails that said you changed my life forever. If you can impact people's lives in a positive way, what a, what an incredible gift from God. You know, of course, you guys get asked this question all the time, but. Uh, I, I, I always wonder as well, you know, but let me put a twist on it, right? If you could have been, uh, you know, you were a successful actress as, as things played out, right? Yeah. If you could have been a successful actress on a different path where you did uh, several different movies and TV shows, etc., but were, never played this groundbreaking character, which one would you have preferred? Well, I didn't know it was groundbreaking to begin with, so you become very uh, brilliant in hindsight. <laughs> if it had not been for Dr. Martin, for a chance meeting with Dr. Martin Luther King, the night after I had uh, given Gene Roddenberry my resignation after the first season, uh, to pursue my 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 love, which was uh, singing and acting and theater, uh, I, it would have been a different story altogether. But he put it into perspective for me. And said when I said thank you for all the beautiful things you're saying about my, me being on that screen and how I, uh, you know, um, how I created the character and with the dignity and so forth, I'm really going to miss my my. Um, now I think I'll really miss my co-stars. And he said, "What are you What are you talking about?" And I said, "Well, I'm leaving the show." And Dr. King said, "You just you cannot do that." Wow, that's really interesting that he's the one that influenced you in that direction. And then yes. was that before or after what is now considered the first interracial kiss on television that, that you was, had with uh, William Shatner? Before. That was after the that was at the end of the first season uh, that I met him. That I told Gene I was leaving. Gene was was. Uh, uh, truly upset. He thought it was because my role had not uh, uh, developed the way he had expected it to or whatever. But it really wasn't about, about that. I thought, you know, I can live without this, and this has been a wonderful experience and a wonderful addition to my resume. <laughs> <laughs> and then it kind of took over your life, uh, for, you know, for better or for worse, and, and mainly for the better, obviously. Yes. We're, we're going to get to that in a second, but when you guys did that, what is now considered uh, by many to be the first interracial kiss, I know there's some debate on it, but um, did you understand the significance of it? Well, it was the first romantic kiss, uh, really seriously, uh, between uh, black and white. You can talk about um, interracial when you're saying that where there might have been, I think so someone uh, smooched. Uh, 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 you know, congenially uh, with Sammy Davis Jr. or something with someone. With Frank Sinatra, that's right. And then, yeah, and, and, then, and, a, and then Shatner had really kissed an alien that was Vietnamese. But. About romance, but in the fact, we resented it because we were being forced into entertaining these people of another planet that had these kinetic powers. But when you guys were on the set, did you think, oh my God, I can't believe we're going to do this? You know, absolutely not. Uh, the, all of us on the set had a mindset of, of, of where Gene was coming from, you know, to, for the most part. And it was just another, you looked at it and you said, oh, this is cool. It's really a nice scene. <laughs> and it plays, it played in, it, ha, it wasn't arbitrary. It, it was about the entire film, and uh, a, a, and and an important uh, input to the film about the morality of what it was. Gene wrote morality plays. I accused him of that once, and he and he put his finger to his mouth and said, Shh, <laughs> "The front office hasn't figured that out yet." <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's why so many people love Star Trek. Yeah. You know, you mentioned Gene Roddenberry in your autobiography. So I got to ask you about this because I never knew this, and this is really interesting. So you said in the in the book that you guys had an an affair. Uh, is that true? I really didn't call it an affair. Uh, an affair is when it's uh, 
something's wrong with it, I guess, or, or whatever. Otherwise, you're... Jean was... Um, um, uh, separated from his wife. They were getting a divorce, which they eventually did do. And, dur- and I was divorced and had a young son. And our relationship grew out of uh, our mutual interest in in our in in our artistry, and so it didn't seem like anything uh, that it seems like now. Because uh, subsequently, I said, "Gene, no, I have to pursue my career." He understood that. I don't think he really understood it, but <laughs> <laughs> but he he um, when was he married Mato Barrett, uh, and and. Um, and we remained good friends. That was not an affair, something that breaks up if it doesn't go further. It didn't break up. We just we were good friends with great respect for one another. It, so it, it, that three years later, um, see, Gene had given me my first um, starring role. He didn't know me, uh, and in um, and. In an episode of his first series called *The Lieutenant*, starring Gary Lockwood, mm-hmm. and so that kind of pole vaulted my career in in television and movies. Um, but when I wanted to continue to pursue my career um, in theater, it took me in a different direction, and so. We parted in very good fr- as very good friends, and remained so. And I w- lo and behold, three years later, uh, he's got another series, but I didn't know it because I was in Europe. Uh, something called Star Trek, and my agent called me and said, "Come home, they're doing Star Trek." He thought I knew what he was talking about, and I did not. But he convinced me to come home, um, and and. Uh, read for it, and I walked in and saw Gene Roddenberry. I said, Mr. Roddenberry, what are you doing here? He says, oh, I have a little something to do with this. And uh, I... I um, so the relationship was before Star Trek? The relationship was between, oh, yes, uh, three years before. Oh, wow, that's interesting And I hadn't well. seen him for two and a half years. All right. By the time I returned, he was happily married to uh, the beautiful Major uh, Barrett, uh, who was also a very good friend of mine, and uh, we had no problems. Yeah. It wasn't like a ooh 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 ooh, and <laughs> and <laughs> I, and I rem- the only reason I think I put it in the book because Jean ha- had said if I if if I ever if I didn't he would. <laughs> okay, fair enough. He was very proud. You you lived a, a very full and interesting life, and you know Dr. May Jamison, the first African. I'm sorry, the first American uh, female astronaut, United States Air Force colonel. Uh, she was the first woman of color, Mae Jemison, Dr. Jemison. It was one of the most brilliant women I've ever met. And, and I am so proud to call her my friend. When I go to, to Houston, I stay at her house. When she's here, at, when she comes to L.A., she stays at my home. And she credits you for uh, getting her, uh, inspiring her to become an astronaut, so does... Uh, uh, Air Force Colonel uh, Bluford, who was the first African American astronaut. So it's an amazing uh, life. And but I, I want to ask you before we run out of time about your new movie. Uh, I hope so. uh, let us get to that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm delighted over this film. So tell tell us about it. What's your role in it, and what's it about? Well, it's a very serious film. It's uh, a, about a young military interrogator, young man who's been turned into an interrogate interrogator. Um, he returns from Iraq, and what he's been put through in, in this form of becoming an interrogator, uh, uh, he returns from an, uh, Iraq with uh, acute post-traumatic stress and, uh, uh, disorder. And he is, a turn, in turn, is, um, sees this clin- a, a, a clinical psychiatrist, which is, is who I play. Mm-hmm. And be, he is this proud American soldier. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. A very proud American soldier who believes in the American way and, and all of its beauty. But he's been taught to go over, to overseas 
and do terrible things to prisoners in the name of national security. Now, and, it, and it goes against his grain. When he returns home, he realizes that this is wrong, but he has to do it because this is his country. And, and this um, very astute therapist takes him through his problems and, uh, with, with flashbacks and flashforwards, um, trying to help him deal with this problem. And um, uh, all is not what it seems to be. All right. Uh, we're unfortunately out of time there, but everybody's got to check out The Torturer. Nichelle Nichols is in it, and we want to thank her so much for joining us on The Young Turks. I thank you so much. All right. Young Turks. You'll be a woman soon.